Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where our mission is to provide education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. USA Global TV and Radio connects you with experts and audiences all around the world every single day to help you succeed in business and to live a richer life. Visit us at usaglobaltv.com to learn about career and life-changing training and mentoring programs like The Listening Mentor. Subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about our special programs and offers. Discover how you can become a guest on one of our shows or a host or producer of a USA Global TV and radio show of your very own. That's USA Global TV and radio, where the doctor is always in. Hello, everyone. A huge welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Maybe it's chilly, maybe it's hot, but we are on point here at USA Global TV and Radio as we are providing world-class education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. Our show today is the United Kingdom News and Culture. It's episode 95. And wherever you are in the world, there's always something going on in the news media in some way, whether it's in Hollywood, whether it's in print, whether it's just something on social media about the royal family, as well as what's going on in the United Kingdom. Well, we're here to set the record straight with our expert correspondents who are there in the United Kingdom, bringing us the latest and greatest. Let's welcome first, Diane floyd Beam. She's an international award-winning author of children's books and young adult books. And she has won all kinds of awards. I don't even know how she has time to be with us, but we are thrilled that she is. Let's welcome her to the show. Diane, hello. Hi, Dr. Jacqueline. I'm blushing in case you can't tell. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Diane. What are you working on now? Um, actually, I'm starting to work on a lot of short stories, and uh, I'm overwhelmed at the uh, way people are receiving my book. So I would just want to send a thank you out to everyone. And uh, Dr. Jacqueline is so excited. It's exciting. It's number 95. I mean, wow. Kudos for you. And it's just so lovely to be a part of this whole team. Well, thanks so much, Diane. Thanks for being part of this journey. And let's welcome the rest of our team members, the lovely, vivacious Helena Shard. Hello. Hey, so lovely to see you. My goodness, you've got so much energy coming out of you, Jacqueline. Dr. Jacqueline, it's, it's contagious. I love it. Oh, I needed well, it as well. You. Taking my vitamins. So, And you're looking very pretty <laughs> and pink today. Oh, thank you. Well, <laughs> We're excited to hear what you have to report. And before we get to that, let's welcome the dynamic, the dapper, Mr. Simon McDonald. Hello. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be nice to be home, I think, is the, <laughs> the term I'm actually looking for. This feels like home today. But, uh, oh, it is cold here in Scotland. And uh, I'll, I'll let you into a little secret. I've got a hot water bottle on my back today. It oh. is so cold and the heating is on full blast in the house and I'm still cold. Oh my, oh my goodness. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. You know, we actually oh. have some other friends who are show hosts here on our platform and they're in the United Kingdom wearing, uh, I get, we call them long johns, full fleece <laughs> blankets with slippers. But yeah, you see them and they look completely just peaceful. You can think they're on a beach, but they're freezing. So. <laughs> Thanks the show much. must go on. <laughs> Absolutely. So as you know, you heard in the introduction, we are always reading things here in the States about the royal family, about the United Kingdom. We don't know if they're true or not true. We've got things on Netflix. So let's just clear the air now and let's just get right into the news and culture episode 95. Let's go over to Helena. Wow. Well, I don't know what you're hearing in the States, but and there's so much going on over here. But do you know what? It, it's so good to always concentrate on the positive because there is loads of positive when you sort of get rid of all the frayed edges. But um, I think I was, well, I have been and I am thrilled that the royal family at the moment are showing absolute unity and that's what's required and needed and it's really lovely to see 
um, the royal family as in the king and queen, accompanied by the prince and princess of Wales. Um, this was last night and they welcomed the world's ambassadors to Buckingham Palace. So it was a sort of really twinkly evening. Everyone was dressed up and looked beautiful, lots of smiles um, and lots of chatting. Um, so this is, look how beautiful Princess of Wales looks. I just, I love that. You can see everyone's very happy around her. Look at that beautiful Jenny Packham dress twinkling there. And um, I don't know what tiara that is, but very beautiful. I, I must get myself a tiara. But anyway, so it's a really lovely evening had by all. Um, it's the diplomatic yearly reception, which celebrates London as home to one of the largest diplomatic corps in the world. So um, a, a really great evening. And everyone looks very relaxed. I mean, there's lots going on. I've seen books and um, I hope you can hear me. I can hear doubling up, but um, I will keep talking. We can hear you. Um, but, Oh, great stuff. Great. So um, really fabulous conversation and lots of uh, great photographs were taken. Um, amazing as well that the Princess of Wales had earlier um, been at an event, as she does so well. Um, and she's opened a children's day surgery unit at Evelina London, which is um, it's a children's hospital. And she was wearing her trouser suit, her, drain, her day look of, of, yeah, there we go. It's sort of like a teal blue Alexandra McQueen suit. And she had her blue high heels on as well. Um, but this is a fabulous. She's a patron of Evelina London Children's Hospital, has been since 2019. Um, and this, this unit that's been opened is going to really change the way uh, children and, and family are cared for because everything's over one under one roof. Uh, so being in one place, they can see thousands and thousands more children each year. Um, so again, everyone was really happy to chat. She turned up, smiles, looking. She just managed just to emulate something very special. And there is obviously a lot of uh, negativity around. So good on her. I mean, she represents the royal family so well. And I think what was lovely as well was to see um, inspirational Tony Hudgel. Now, we, we've discussed him a few times. Um, he's hoping to spread his Christmas magic. Now, just as a reminder, Tony Hudgel from a very young age, I think from 41 days old of his life, believe it or not, was unfortunately abused by his parents. He had terrible injuries and unfortunately had to have his legs amputated, but that's not held him back. And he really is an inspiration to everybody. Um, he, uh, he decided he wanted to raise loads of money. Um, I can't remember his name, Captain, anyway, it will come to me shortly, but he took lead from him. He raised two million pounds and actually this went to the Evelina London Children's Hospital. So two million pounds. He's now, he's only young. I mean, I think we sort of met him at the age of four, four years old. Absolutely cheeky chappy, full of chat, really great. And he's now spreading his Christmas cheer. He's doing a new thing where he's taking you know, presents to children who are ill and have challenges. Um, and is traveling around so that's something he's doing now but the great thing is he met the princess of wales yesterday and they chatted and had photographs taken and um he said he was going to write a story about the second time which is the second time that he met her and said that she was very beautiful um but amazing that he's raised that two million and he's carrying on raising loads and loads of money so uh that's great so I, you know i think did incredibly well and I think we've seen the photographs of, of how beautiful she looked. Um, something else is that I wanted, moving on from the royals, it's, it is royal actually, um, this is to do with over 50 years of loyalty which to me is, isn't that amazing, 50 years of loyalty and happiness. Now um, I'm going to see a, a great comedy play uh, next week which I'm really looking forward to and it's called Backstairs Billy and this is the story of William Billy Talon that's his name well actually it's Billy Talon his first name is, is William now these two pictures here these are actually the, the artists that are playing the late Queen Elizabeth as in the late Queen Elizabeth's mother so the late Queen Mum 
um, and also Billy Talon. So this is a famous actress called Pen Penelope Wilton here in the UK, who's playing the Queen Mum, and a lovely Luke Evans, hunky Luke Evans, who's playing Billy. Um, he has actually lost 17 pounds. It's only been running for a few weeks. He's lost 17 pounds, he's incredibly ripped now. But anyway, this is the story of the Queen Mother's favorite servant. And as we said, Billy, and it's uh, directed by Michael Grandage, who is a fabulous director. Um, and I, I think, as I said, the whole thing, it's all to do with over 50 years loyalty. And it's a fun story. A lot of it is held in Clarence House. Um, there's lots of drink and frivolity that takes place. It actually takes place in 1979, which is quite an austere time here in the UK. It was Maggie Thatcher's uh, was Prime Minister. Um, but it shows this whole relationship that's built between the two of them. Um, he, she, the late Queen Mum, lost uh, George VI, her husband, quite early on. Um, and then, in fact, spent so much time with, with Billy, who was, in effect, like at her butler. Um, I, just a little bit as well about him in real life, from a very young age, from about 10 years old, he wanted to work with the royal family. He wrote to them every year. And in, eventually at 15, he was actually employed as just as an assistant. Um, and then he went on in 1954 to work with the Queen Mum. This is a performance that's on at the, uh, the Duke of uh, York Theatre, which was opened in 1892. Um, I am just incredibly excited to see it because I think it's going to be good fun. And obviously you've got Yorkshire Terriers and, and, and things like that that are going to be um, on stage. And I just, I'm so excited. I love anything that that's on in London, but this is something different. And I think the director decided to do it because obviously he saw The Crown was doing so well, Helen Mirren is the Queen doing so well. And he thought, actually, this is something which is history, um, and report something really quite positive. Um, and I know for the Queen Mum, she respected him, and that's Billy Talon, incredibly and adored him uh, for her whole life. And and actually, you know, the, the thing is at her funeral, you really you saw him, there he is with the corgis, oh, that's him, the real one. And he was actually crying at her funeral. They really, they formed such a strong bond. So, um, incredibly happy and going from one thing to another because obviously that was held and is, is it takes place um, in Clarence house and today uh, Queen Camilla she's invited many children and families to decorate the Clarence Christmas tree I'm feeling very twinkly now this actually is not taken from today this is last year but the lovely thing she does is uh, she invites lots of children and families support that sort of the patronages that the Queen supports each year. So this year it's the Helen and Douglas House uh, charity and also Roald Dahl's marvellous children charity. Um, and there are lots of, <laughs> it's so funny, we're then putting Christmas decorations up, but she always does that and there's Father Christmas and lots of twinkly things and food and chatting that goes on, uh, but that's happening today. And the, I think the Roald Dahl Marvellous Children Charity as well, they've got some wonderful nurses that uh, look after children that are terminally ill and they do such a great, great job. So I really hope everything's going well. I'm sure it is, and I can't wait to see all the footage. I can't be there, but um, one of those things, I can imagine it's Christmassy. I'm feeling Christmassy, which is which is actually quite rare, I have to say. But I, I'm going to, um, I think, Roald Dahl, I think moving on, I'm going to talk about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, so Roald Dahl obviously wrote Charlie, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in 1964. Now that's a, a, a you know, obviously a, a children's novel. And to me, it's, I absolutely loved it when I was younger. And it's the whole adventures of Charlie inside the chocolatiers, Willy Wonka's factory. And from this, um, a new film is coming out this Friday. It has already premiered, and I think it's coming out in a few weeks in the States. Um, and it tells the whole wondrous story of how the world's greatest inventor, 
magician, chocolate maker sort of became the beloved Willy Wonka. And it's going to be a really sort of heartfelt, soft, um, joyful, magical, creative uh, film. I mean, again, I'm sort of a child at heart and I love all these stories, these kind of, they're not children, I think they're for everybody. Um, so it's, it's released Friday. It's actually being made by the same team that uh, did Paddington 2. It's written by Paul King. Um, and Timothy Ch Chalamet, who's a great actor, he plays Willy Wonka. And Hugh Grant plays the Impa Loompa, which I can't believe that Hugh Grant's agreed to play an Impa Loompa. That's a, a very odd one. Uh, but I, the, 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 the exciting thing, yeah, this is just to give a little bit of a, that's obviously the Roald Dahl, the book, the original one, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, that I remember so well. Um, but I just think it's going to be so lovely. And the thing that I take from this, and in fact, it sort of, it's, it, it's a finally weaves its way, weaves its way through everything is every good thing in this world started with a dream. So hold on to yours. And I think that's so powerful because that can be applied to everything and everyone. Um, and this is the, the film which is going to be shown this Friday. Um, that's really where it starts, which is which is really exciting, I think. Um, and moving on from there, I believe we have now. Let me just try and think. Are we talk, I think we've got a lovely little video that I will. Just a little bit I want to speak about because I'm feeling quite twinkly and quite Christmas sexy at the moment, as I've mentioned. So Kew Gardens is a botanical garden in Kew, which is the site of a, a former estate in the London Borough of Richmond. It's actually a former royal estate, sorry, should I say. And and that's sort of um, sort of on the ten, Thames in a way. In 2003, it was made a UNESCO heritage site. Um, it was privately owned by gardens intended sort of in the 16th century. But just wanting to show really sort of some glittering tunnels of light and, you know, dancing lakeside re reflections and trees and jewel like I don't know, colours and everything. Just a little taste of Christmas. So it'd be lovely to, to play this. Um, Does everyone feel a little bit Christmassy? Or is it just me? I love twinkles. The reindeers are coming out there. Yeah, they're coming out in droves. <laughs> I love that. It did put me in the Christmas spirit. Oh. You know? mm -hmm. oh, I just love it. And it's beautiful as well. Kew Gardens is absolutely beautiful. It's a stunning place to go to. I know it's very warm where you are in the States, but in the summer as well, Kew Gardens is just such a lovely place to, to just sit and reflect and think and look at all the wonderful plants. Um, so for me, yeah. it means a lot. I think I think everybody seems to be getting Christmassy earlier this year as well. So uh, it's nice. It's lovely. <laughs> I put out the advent can um, the advent candles and light one each Sunday. So it it helps bring out the Christmas spirit. I think. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Thanks. Oh. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you, Helena. That was really fascinating. By the way, I uh, where is one of those pictures I just wanted to bring up? But um, just absolutely beautiful. I, I, I love this so much. I, I love the red. Aww. Isn't that just, I don't know, just puts you in such a nice mood. I think that's so lovely. I can just well imagine how it went today at Clarence House. You know, the Queen Camilla is such fun. She loves children. She loves people. She's very animated and she loves 
creativity and I, ju I just can imagine it's a, it would have been a lovely lovely day but it will be and it probably still is a lovely day they're probably still there yeah it will be and I know you, this is an older picture but doesn't that tree the green of the tree look so alive like I don't think I've ever had a Christmas tree like that well I guess because they were artificial that might make sense <laughs> 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 no, it's beautiful. It is um, a beautiful <laughs> tradition that she's doing. I think it's lovely. And I uh, love seeing um, the Princess of Wales and, as you stated, her twinkly dress. What about her skin and her hair? Unbelievable. Gorgeous, right? Stunning. Isn't she? She does. She does so well. There's been a bit of negativity, but she just rises above it and does so well. And the love as well that she receives and gives out as well when you see it it's palpable it's really good well just so, so you know proud. we haven't heard any negativity only praise for her at least where i'm at <laughs> oh that's fabulous i think i think unfortunately there's a lot of things that are not, haven't come to light and it's it's more to do with the book yeah um, I've, where I've things have been raised but it's, it's 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 actually not yeah so it's pe people get carried away especially at times of when things aren't so good and people want to attack don't they so but it's all going to be fine it will be fine well yes. the four of us will keep love in our heart that's right Yay. Yeah. <laughs> it will not spread rumors <laughs> <laughs> absolutely actually that's what happens more than rumors goodness very true well thank you for that and putting us into the Christmassy mood and Simon you're going to put us into a different type of mood more historical factual but really important so thank you for the the information you're going to be sharing today about the Pentagon That's right All right yes well today I mean last week I, I, I crossed the Atlantic and, uh, and and took the chance of uh, doing a piece on the White House and the series called uh, seats of power. And I was thinking, well, we're going to do, you know, the House of Parliament here this week. And I thought, no, we'll just stay on the Atlantic at the moment as well and uh, do a piece on the Pentagon. Uh, I had to had to run it past one or two people first just to make sure I hadn't crossed any lines. And, uh, you know, and it was it was fine. There was a little bit of editing and then came back and uh, actually I got more information out of it as well. So it's great. And uh, as I go through this, then there'll be some photographs coming up as well. Because it's quite a, an extraordinary building. It's really, really totally, totally unique in, uh, in, in many respects. And it's massive. So the Pentagon, it's uh, the headquarters building of the United States Department of Defense. Uh, it's in Arlington County, Virginia, across the uh, Potomac River from Washington, D.C. It was, it was constructed and... and accelerated schedule during World War II. As a symbol of US uh, military, the, the phrase the Pentagon is often used as a, a mentonym for uh, Department of Defense and its leadership. Anyway, the building, it was designed by American architect George Bergstrom and built by the contractor John McShane. And the ground was broken for it on the 11th of September 1941, and the building was dedicated in uh, the 15th of January 1943, so it didn't take them long to throw that one up, and it was a big place. Ge uh, General uh, Baron Somerville uh, provided the major impetus to gain congressional approval for the project, and Colonel Leslie Groves was re responsible for overseeing the project of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which supervised it. Uh, the Pentagon is actually the world's second largest office building with about six and a half million square feet of floor space, of which 3.7 million square feet are used as offices. It's got five sides, obviously, five floors above ground and two basement levels as well. With the five ring corridors per floor with a total of 17 and a half miles of corridors and a central five acre pentagonal plaza of about, uh, about, yeah, there's about 23,000 military and civilian employees who work in the Pentagon, as well as about 3,000 non-defense support personnel. In 2001, while the Pentagon was damaged during the September 11th attacks, as we know, five Al-Qaeda hijackers flew American uh, Airlines Flight 77 into the western side of the building, killing themselves and 184 other people, 59 on the plane and 125 in the Pentagon. Following the attacks, the western side of the building was repaired with uh, a small indoor memorial chapel added at the point of impact. 
An outdoor memorial dedicated to the Pentagon victims of 9-11 opened in 2008. And until the Pentagon was built, the United States Department of War was headquartered in the, the munitions building, a temporary structure erected at the end of World War I along Constitution Avenue on the National Mall. The War, the war Department, which was a, a civilian agency created to administer the US Army, was spread out in additional temporary buildings on the National Mall, as well as dozens of other buildings in Washington, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Now, in the late 1930s, during the Great Depression, federal construction program, uh, a, new, a new War Department building was constructed on the 21st and C streets of Foggy Bottom. But um, upon completion, the new building did not solve the department space problem. It became the headquarters of the Department of State instead. So when World War II broke out in Europe in 1939, the War Department rapidly expanded to deal with current issues and in anticipation that the United States would be drawn into the conflict, of course. So Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson found the situation unacceptable with the munitions building overcrowded and department offices spread out in additional sites. Stimson told US President Franklin D. Roosevelt in May 41 that the War Department needed additional space. So on the 17th of July 1941, a congressional hearing took place organized by Congressman Clifton Woodrum regarding proposals for the new War Department buildings. Woodrum pressed Brigadier General Eugene Raybould, who uh, represented the War Department at the hearing, for an overall solution to the department's space problem. And uh, rather than building yet more temporary buildings, so Raybould agreed to report back to the congressman within five days, and the War Department called upon its construction chief, General Brennan Somerville, to come up with a plan. Government officials agreed that the, the War Department building, officially designated Federal Office Building Number 1, should be constructed in Arlington County, Virginia, across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. Uh, requirements for the new building were that it be no more than four storeys tall than that, and it used just a minimal amount of steel to reserve that resource for war needs. So the requirements meant that instead of rising vertically, the building would be sprawling over a large area. Possible sites for the building uh, including the, uh, included the Department of Agriculture's uh, Arlington Experimental Farm adjacent to the Arlington National Cemetery and uh, the obsolete Hoover Airfield site as well. The first site chosen was Arlington Farms, which had an asymmetric, roughly pent pentagonal shape, so the building was planned accordingly in an irregular pentagon. I'm concerned that uh, the new building could obstruct the view of Washington, D.C. from Arlington Cemetery, President Roosevelt selected the Hoover Airport site instead. Well, the building retained the pentagonal layout because Roosevelt liked it and a major redesign at that stage would have actually been too costly. And freed of the constraints of the Arlington farm site, the building was actually modified into a regular pentagon. So it re represents the star forts constructed during the gunpowder age. 28th of July, Congress authorized funding for a new department war building in Arlington. And President uh, Roosevelt officially approved the Hoover Airport site on the 2nd of September. While the project went through the approval process in late July 41, uh, Somerville selected the contractors, including John McShane, Inc. of Philadelphia, which had uh, built Washington National Airport in, Air in Arlington, the uh, Jefferson Memorial in Washington, and the National Naval Medical Center in Maryland, along uh, with Wise Constructing Company as well, and Doyle and Russell, both from Virginia. So it was quite a conglomeration there. But in addition to the Hoover Airport site and other government-owned land, construction of the Pentagon required an additional 287 acres, which were acquired at a cost of $2.2 million, which is the, it's the equivalent of $33.9 million of today's money. The Hell's Bottom neighborhood, uh, consisting of numerous pawn shops and factories and approximately 150 homes and other buildings around Columbia Pike, was cleared to make way for the Pentagon. So later, 300 acres of land were transferred to the Arlington National Cemetery and to Fort Mayer, leaving 280 acres for the Pentagon. The Pentagon building itself spans 
28.7 acres and includes an additional 5.1 acres as the central courtyard, as I mentioned. And starting with the north side and moving clockwise, its five facade entrances are the Mall Terrace, the River Terrace, the Concourse or Metro Station, and the South Parking, and the Heliport, of course. On the north side of the building, the Mall Entrance, which also features a portico, leads out to a 600-foot-long terrace that's used for ceremonies. The river entrance, which features a portico projecting out 20 feet on the uh, northeast side, overlooking the lagoon and facing Washington. Uh, there's a stepped terrace to the river entrance, which leads down to the lagoon until late 1960s to ferry personnel from uh, Bolling Air Force Base and the Pentagon. The main entrance for visitors is on the southeast side, uh, as are Pentagon Metro Station and the bus station. And there's also a concourse on the southeast side of the second floor of the building, which contains a mini shopping mall. And the south parking lot adjoins the southwest facade, and uh, the west side of the Pentagon faces Washington Boulevard. Concentric rings are designed from the center out as A through to E, with additional F and G rings in the basement. So E-ring uh, offices are the only ones with outside views and are generally occupied by senior officials. Uh, subterranean floors in the Pentagon are lettered B for basement and M for mezzanine. Now there's logic. Uh, the concourse is on the second floor of the metro entrance and above ground floors are numbered one to five. Again, straightforward. It's possible to walk between any two points in the Pentagon in less than 10 minutes, though the optimal route may involve a brisk walk, uh, routing through the open air central courtyard as well. The uh, complex includes eating and exercise facilities, as well as meditation and prayer rooms and various other rooms as well. Uh, the Pentagon has six Washington, D.C. zip codes, despite its location in Arlington County in Virginia. U.S. Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the four service branches actually each have their own zip code for it. So I think it's some of the incidents that's happened around the Pentagon. Uh, during the late 1960s, the Pentagon became a focal point for protests against the Vietnam War. A group of about two and a half thousand women organized by the Women's Strike for Peace demonstrated outside Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara's office at the Pentagon on the 15th of February 67. Then in May 1967, a group of 20 demonstrators held a sit-in outside the Joint Chiefs of Staff's office, which lasted for four days before they were finally arrested. In one of the better known incidents on the 21st of October 1967, some 35,000 anti-war protesters organized by the National Mobilization Committee to end war in Vietnam uh, gathered for a demonstration at the Defense Department. Uh, that was the march on the Pentagon. They were confronted by some two and a half thousand armed soldiers. Uh, during the protest, a famous picture was taken uh, where George Harris placed carnations in the soldiers' gun barrels. The march concluded with an attempt to exercise the building. Then on the 19th of May, 1972, the Weather Underground organization bombed a fourth floor women's restroom in retaliation for the Nixon administration's bombing of Hanoi in the final stages of the Vietnam War. On the 17th of March 2007, 4,000 to 15,000 people, estimates seem to vary quite significantly in this one, uh, protested the Iraq War by marching from the Lincoln Memorial to the Pentagon's North parking lot. And then, of course, on September the 11th, 2001, which coincidentally was the 60th anniversary of the Pentagon's groundbreaking, the five Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, hijackers took control of American Airlines Flight 77 en route from Washington to Los Angeles and uh, deliberately crashed the Boeing, the Boeing 757 airliner into the western side of the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m as part of the 7, September 11 attacks. It was the final significant foreign attack on, on federal uh, facilities in the capital area since the burning of Washington during the War of 1812. The impact, it severely damaged the outer ring of one wing of the building and caused its partial collapse. 
at the time of the attacks, the Pentagon was under renovation, uh, fortunately, and many offices were actually unoccupied, resulting in fewer casualties. Uh, due, due to the renovation work, only 800 people were there, as opposed to the usual 4,500, so it could have been an awful lot worse. Furthermore, the area hit uh, on the side of the heliport uh, facade was the section which was actually best prepared for such an attack. And the, the renovation there had almost been completed. So it was the only area of the Pentagon with a sprinkler system, and it had been reconstructed with a web of steel columns and bars to withstand bomb blasts. So the steel reinforcement bolted together to form a continuous structure through all of the Pentagon's five floors, kept the section of the building from collapsing for 30 minutes, which was enough time for hundreds of people to eventually crawl out to safety. The area struck by the plane also had blast resistant windows, which are two inches thick and two and a half thousand pounds in weight each. Uh, that stayed intact during the crash and the fire. Uh, it had fire doors that opened automatically and newly built exits that allowed people to get out. And contractors already involved with the renovation were given the added task of rebuilding the sections of the damage in the attacks. Uh, this additional project was named Phoenix Product Project and was charged with having the, the outermost offices of the damaged section occupied by the 11th of September 2002. When the damaged section of the Pentagon was repaired, a small indoor memorial and chapel were added at the point of impact, and an American flag is hung each year on the side of the Pentagon damaged in the attacks, and the side of the building is illuminated at night with blue lights. After the attacks, Plans were developed for an outdoor memorial with construction underway in 2006. And this Pentagon memorial consists of a part of two acres of land containing 184 benches, one dedicated to each victim. And the benches are aligned along the flight line of Flight 77, according to the victims' ages as well, from age 3 to 71. And the park opened to the public on the 11th of September. 2008. So, and it's an interesting story and uh, yeah, a very poignant story as well. And just seemed to be so many coincidences with it as well, with the 9-11 uh, attack being on the same, the same date of 9-11 uh, as when ground was first broken to build the Pentagon. Wow, this is fascinating. Wow, that was amazing. I, I learned so much that I didn't know, and I live here in this country. Diane, I bet that a lot of that you knew. No, I, I learned a lot, and um, I am glad that you reminded us that the ground breaking for the building was on September 11th. Very, very interesting. It, it, it's incredible. I mean, you know, in, in history, you do find there seems to be lots of coincidences as this. You, I mean, numerologists uh, have all sorts of theories about it. But, uh, but yeah, it is. It's quite, uh, it, it's almost quite spooky when you get uh, a coincidence like that happening. I thought it was also interesting that it's only a 10 minute walk from any part to another part there. That was... That's it. And 17.1 miles of corridors. If you take a wrong turning, okay, your 10 minutes gets multiplied somewhat. <laughs> and I'm quite sure a lot of people, even people who work there day in, day out, they uh, probably do take wrong turnings from time to time. But there is that shortcut across the, uh, the, the plaza in the middle as well. But I mean, that plaza in the photographs actually looks quite small, but it's five and a half acres. So it's, uh, you know, the scale of it all is, it, it is incredible. Yeah, there it is with the trees growing in the middle. And uh, that's five and a half acres in there. It, but it, you know, it's uh, I drive past it all the time when I'm uh, visiting my kiddos. And just the parking lot alone, or the parking lots alone, yeah. <laughs> are massive. Imagine, They're bigger than a mall. <laughs> I mean, trying to find your car in amongst that lot. You know, <laughs> it take you forever. But I mean, my, my sort of connection to the Pentagon is I used to supply it with smoked salmon. For, uh, for, 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 for for those who have the outside office views. <laughs> so. Of course you do. I, and I thought that was very interesting about the zip codes for each branch of the military. So. Yeah, it's just so the, uh, you know, it, it, because each, well, each branch of the military have got their own secrets from the other as well. So it just That's makes true. sure that, 
one doesn't get cross paths. I mean, could you imagine the mail room in that place? It's you know, it, it's got to be really something else. Yeah, I never thought about it, but I bet you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the security too. Well, well security. thank you. It was Different yeah, it was world. fascinating. Definitely. Well, both of you, Helen and Simon, once again, both of you stepping up and providing this uh, world-class information for us and for our audiences. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Do you want a few of on this day? Because yes, I've got sure. one or two Let's there. Hear it. So on this day in 1790, U.S. Congress moved from New York City to Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. In 1973, Gerald Ford was sworn in as the first unelected vice president, succeeding, succeeding uh, Spiro Agnew, who resigned over corruption allegations. Birthdays, well, I've got um, Henry VI, King of England, and it was um, 1421 he was born in uh, Windsor Castle in England. And then uh, who's the next one we've got? We've got, uh, yes, oh, we've got, a, we've got a sad one. We've got a death. St. Nicholas in 343 AD. The Greek bishop who became the model for Santa Claus died at the age of 73. So Sorry. there we oh. go. But don't tell the kids that. Sure? Santa Claus is a <laughs> well. Well, even well. <laughs> yeah, that's an unusual all, one. That's, yeah. It is rather an unusual yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, don't ask me how I managed to dig up all these things and so on. Some of them actually already have implanted in there. Why, I don't know. <laughs> no, they're always interesting, though. I, I think I shared with you when I was at another channel before I started this, the the guy that I worked with, the, the announcer broadcaster, he would always do on this day. And it was always related to food. It's it's National Hoagie Day. It's National Donut Day. It's Cheese and Ham Day. It's And he'd always bring me food, which I loved. I would say, whatever it was, he brought in. So we're, we're getting a little deeper here on this platform. So thank you for yeah. that. No, it's very, I mean, I have great, great, great fun, great pleasure in, uh, you know, in, in, in drawing these things out and so on. It uh, is good over a dinner party as well. You suddenly just sort of drop one of these things in. I mean, it's a conversation stopper, especially about St. Nicholas. You know, but, <laughs> <laughs> but also you gave a, con uh, uh, a great one. Oh, I just happened to supply the smoked hammond for <laughs> the uh, Pentagon. <laughs> yeah, actually I did for the White House as well. <laughs> and cooked for three presidents. <laughs> amazing, amazing. It's incredible. Incredible. Maybe I'm living on the wrong side of the Atlantic. I like <laughs> we it want you to come and visit, definitely, you and Helena. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. For sure. Well, I'd love for us to go around and share anything we have going on or any holiday wishes. Obviously, you know that we will keep broadcasting throughout the rest of the year. One of us will be here day and night. Who would that be? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we will still be here. Um, I think, what day is, does Christmas fall on? Is it a it's a Monday this time. A Monday, okay. Yes. Monday. And it's on, it's on the 25th of December, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> okay. I, I did know that, yes, for it sure. It starts at midnight and runs right through to the following midnight. <laughs> so we have uh, two or three weeks left, but if anyone wants to share something that they're doing, maybe there's some exciting party you're being invited to or you're hosting or something you're coming out with professionally, personally. Diane, let's start with you. Um, I, I, to me, Christmas is everything about family. I usually attend some parties, but this year we are back in the car, <laughs> driving to Virginia, um, having Christmas with my kids home. So that's pretty cool. Excellent. Anything you want to share about your work professionally? Um, no, I, I kind of said it earlier, but I do wish everybody that's celebrating Hanukkah um, because it starts this week. Happy Hanukkah. And uh for the world to um, pray for peace on earth and to keep joy and love in your heart. Ah, oh, beautiful. Thank you very much, Diane. How about you, Helena? What would you like to share? I'm going to, I just really going back to some of the things that I, I was talking about, about um, back to there's Billy, Billy Talon. He had a dream and his dream from the age of you know, really young, he was about seven, was that he always wanted to work for the royal family. And he 
he went for it. He tried every single year and eventually he got what he wanted, which was great. And also uh, the, the film that we're, we're going to be seeing, well, hopefully we'll see after next Friday, after this Friday, um, Wonka is, you know, every good thing starts with a dream. I think that's just so important. It's, it is so important to hold on to, isn't it? Because it's yours and, and you can do anything. Anyone can do anything. So um, I wanted to share that. And, and with, with reference to Christmas, you know, just just to enjoy having a relax and finding small joys, which is what I always talk about. Um, and I'm going to definitely do that. Beautiful. Yay. Thank you. Yay. And so Helen, I, I meant to, I'm sorry, Dr. Jordan, I meant to say that was so fascinating about Billy. Sorry, I forgot to say that earlier, but I wanted to I tell just, you that was so, so oh, interesting. Thank you. I'm so interested. I'm, I'm going to see the performance next Thursday, and uh, I'm going to report back. <laughs> oh, I wish you could just, you know, fluff your eyelashes or and be there. Don't uh, you take really the list? Go. Yes. Yeah. Road and road. I just think as well that I think the fifty over fifty years of faithful service and loyalty and you know love and that that means so much, doesn't it? I That's I think they friend. must have developed more of a kindred mother son spirit. I think so. I think knowing that the, the late Queen Mum, I think they probably had secret raucous drunken parties. <laughs> Good for them. <laughs> hey, cheers, I say. <laughs> yes, she enjoyed her drink, and my gosh, she could hold it as well. <laughs> that, that's the Scots blood coming out of her, definitely. <laughs> oh. Yeah, backstairs, Billy, though, I mean, he, he was always there. And every time he saw the Queen Mum, backstairs, Billy was there. But uh, just uh, never left her side. He's a, a great character, and I mean, he his shock of hair, I think, uh, identified him uh, straight away for for anybody. He was the sort of, I suppose, the Boris Johnson of his day, but his hair was a different color. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, don't mention Boris Johnson. That's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a time of goodwill and cheer, and everybody should be happy. <laughs> oh. Just say Luke, Luke Evans, who plays him in the play. I can't wait to see him. He's a very good-looking guy, and he's also got very thick, wonderful hair. I think it still needs, like it. needed a few. It needed a few extensions, I think, to make it <laughs> live up to uh, the real hair. Helena, yeah. you keep talking about these single men. You're killing me over here. What's going on? <laughs> come on, you got to come to the UK. We can go out. <laughs> so handsome. Oh, that would definitely be fun for sure. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we have another show coming up. It's the Royally Rich Lifestyle Show. It'll be on today yeah. at one o'clock Eastern, which is 6 p.m. GMT. And it's done really well. I think we are on episode seven, although we did skip a couple just to stay current with the times. So Helena, thanks to you. Thanks to Ian. Thanks to Philip from the British School of Excellence. The show is one of our top performers. Congratulations. I'm thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are going to be signing off. Our next show is coming up. It's Global Socialpreneur starring Anne Scotland. And it's a highlight reel of some of the best of the best for this year. So if you haven't joined the show before, please do tune in. And then we'll be followed by the Royally Rich Lifestyle Show. So thanks again for being here. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. And thank you all. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Helen. It's been an absolute pleasure. And of course, I really appreciate you and all the effort that you put into preparing for today it's been great, great job. fun <laughs> great job <laughs> all right thank you bye for now bye, bye everybody bye, bye. bye. bye.